Today we're going to talk about the shooter's journey. If you're a shooter, a collector, or a gun person of any kind, you're already on the shooter's journey. I'm going to tell you a little bit about mine and talk about the shooter's journey in general. You know, we, we all start out in the same place on the, sh on the shooter's journey, and then eventually we go different paths. But we almost all of us start out with toy guns. That's where we start out. And when I was a kid, my mother would not let me have toy guns. So I made guns out of sticks, and when I went over to my friend's house, and they had toy guns, I got to play with their, their toy guns. And when we went to uh, Kmart, it was Kmart back in those days, not Walmart. When we went to Kmart, I'd, I'd make my way down to that toy aisle, and I'd grab those little single action army. Back then, they were a metal gun. And I'd be twirling them and playing with them for a few minutes right there. So I got to play with toy guns a little bit. But then uh, as I got older, I got into other things, dirt bikes and stuff, but, but I had BB guns, all right? Most of us have had, had a BB gun or two, the Daisy Red Rider, for an example. Almost everybody had one of those, or a Crossman air gun. And, uh, but eventually, I got a real firearm. And my, my first real firearm was uh, a Winchester Model 94, manufactured in 1896. Because I was, I was really into the, the cowboy guns of Western movies as a kid. You know, I really liked all that stuff, you know, believe it or not. And uh, so when I got an opportunity to buy a real Winchester Model 94 that was from the 1800s, I thought that was really cool. So that was my first gun. I shot my first deer with that. And I got into hunting. And hunting is one of those paths a lot of us have went down. Once you get into firearms, you, you go down the hunting path. And uh, at that point, you might be you might be hunting big game or small game. You might be using shotguns on birds, or you might be using open sights, close range hunting in the woods or something, or you might be using bolt action rifles like I did. And uh, I got to hunt during, uh, I, I mean, I don't know if you'd call it the golden age. The real golden age of hunting in the West was the 1950s and 60s, but I got to hunt in the early 90s in Montana. And it, it was a lot better back then than it is now. And, where, where I hunted was a wilderness. It was a, a public land uh, area that was thousands of square miles. I, uh, I drove in there. I drove 100 miles off the pavement to get to where I camped. And I had uh, a teepee and a wood stove, and I would go in there for a couple of weeks at a time. And then from that point, from where I drove, I would hike two or three miles back there in the wilderness and hunt for, for big, big bucks. Self-guided public land. And uh, I, did get, I did get a pretty nice one in 90, 94, and in 95 I got another one. And uh, so those are really fond memories. You know, there's not a lot of shooting in hunting. Hunting is, is mostly looking for an animal, and the shooting is just the very thing at the last part of it. But shooting is part of it. Working up, uh, in my case, I worked up a hand load. I shot a, uh, uh, a uh, uh, Winchester 270 caliber in a, in a Ruger Mark II uh, bolt action rifle. And uh, so, but from the shooting path, you know, uh, that's not where my firearms journey ended. For some people it does, you know, it's BB guns, 22s, and then they're, they're hunting and they're just all about hunting and that's where they end up, you know. And, and they, they like being there and so they stay there, you know. But for me, as life went on and the hunting wasn't as good as it used to be, then I, I went on to some other things. And I, I had some, uh, I have some examples here. Um, I got into cap and ball a little bit, not too much, but that's a that's another step between uh, a BB gun and a real gun. Uh, these aren't classified as a as a firearm uh, federally in the United States. I don't think yet. Uh, depends on the state, but they're not they're not uh, legally a firearm, but they are a gun. You know, um, like some like a lot of people, I got tired of how long it took to reload these, so I didn't I didn't spend too much time there in the in the cap and ball phase. But uh, I also, before I had those, I actually had a, a replica revolver or two that I used to play with and do fast draw and twirling, things like that. But I also got into 22s, and this is a rifle that uh, I bought for my, uh, my daughter when she was little. It's a, it's a Marlin 22 with a scope. It's a great gun to start a, a kit on. It's single shot only, so it's real safe to you know, give them one, one cartridge at a time to put in there. And, in fire, and they can learn a little bit about a little bit about firearms uh, safety and hunting and precision shooting and things like that. So, the 22 path, I'm sure a lot of you guys have been on that too, uh, maybe as a kid or a teenager. And um, later on, I got uh, 22 pistol. This is just a few years ago. This is a Browning 
Mark II, I think, 22. And uh, cheap, cheap fun. I'm sure a lot of you guys have done this too. And uh, I went through that phase. This thing isn't uh, much to look at, but uh, they are fun. It's cheap shooting, you know. So even now, a lot of people love to shoot shoot a 22. Personally, I, I don't. Once I got away from the 22 into the 45 9, 9 mm, you know, I just I, I just can't get excited about shooting a 22. But uh, a lot of people have a lot of fun doing that. Okay, so at some point, almost every person on the firearms journey ends up in a, in a collection phase. And that's the phase that a lot of people are in, and I can tell they're in it when I talk to them, and when I, when I talk to people in person, also when I when I interact with them on the comments, you know. And I went through that collection phase where you, when you go to the store, when you go to the gun store or whatever, it seems like every gun is so cool you wish you could have them all. And so you, you buy a variety of different guns, and you collect as many as you can. And sometimes you end up going to gun shows and selling some, buying some, trading, whatever. And uh, so you go through that that uh, collection phase and a lot of people end up there and they stay there and they collect forever and some of them don't even shoot anymore after a while they just collect and trade guns and they don't they, they like that more than more than the actual shooting of guns and uh, there's nothing wrong with that you know but I went into that to that phase of, of collecting and wanting all these different guns but I eventually got through that I eventually got to the point where you know I seen a lot of these guns, I shot a lot of them, I bought, I bought a lot of them, I went out with other friends, we traded guns, we shot each other's guns, and I, I kind of got to the point where I just kind of got over the, the collection phase, and I, but I narrowed it down to just a few that I wanted. I wanted the cowboy guns, the Colt 45, single action army type guns, Winchesters, Sharps rifle, um, side by side shotguns. So I, I, I eventually collected uh, uh, an example of every one of those, at least one, you know. And, and once I got that, it's like, you know, other than the race guns, I, I, I just, I don't feel like I need any more guns. I got through that collection phase, but it took me a long time, like 20 years, you know. So that, that collection phase is an interesting thing, and almost all of us end up there at some point in time. We have small collections. Some people have huge collections of hundreds of guns, you know. And uh, so that's one that's one of those paths that you can go down. You can stay on it. Me, I went down it a long time, then got to the point where I was like, you know, th this is what I want. And there's a couple more. I want to get these. Now my collection's done. That's kind of how I am now, you know. But uh, I also went through the uh, the self-defense phase, you know, so where you uh, you really get into the, the self-defense thing. You get some training. You start to conceal carry. You get your concealed carry permit. And that's when I got my first, believe it or not, Glock. This isn't my first one, by the way, but... I got uh, several of these. They, they are very dependable, very accurate. Uh, they make a good hammer, you know, if you've got a nail sticking up or something. Uh, they're, not, they're not really pretty. There's nothing romantic about them to me. I mean, some people, this is all they have. They just love them. And, and to me, they're a very, very dependable, useful tool. And, um, you know, I, I depend on mine. I, I train my family to, uh, to, to shoot with these, you know. So that's... It's a good platform to use, I think, if you got people that don't shoot a lot and they need, you can try to get them to train as much as you can, but they're not going to train that much. So it's a good thing. It's a good idea to have one type of gun that everybody knows how to use. So that was it for me. That was the, that was the, the Glock was, was the dependable gun for that. Now, I also have SIG, I have SIG 320s that I personally carry and I compete with. I like the SIG 320 a lot better than the Glock. Glock's a fine gun, but I just like the SIG 320 better. But it's a similar striker fired gun. Anyway, talking about uh, phases that people go through, I went through a 1911 phase. And that's a path that a lot of people end up on and they never emerge from that. They just, they're all about 1911s and they stay in that 1911. They get as many 1911s as they can and they custom build them and shoot them and that's all they want. And I totally get that. And I was there for a few years. And this is a, a 1911 that I, that I have. It's, it's the only one I have left, actually. I had a few of them. This is a Fusion Firearms 1911. Fusion is a uh, company that makes, they make complete firearms and they make kits. And I bought this as a kit. A, a kit isn't a ghost gun. A kit is a, uh, you buy it from an FFL. It's a, it's a roughly finished gun and you have to finish uh, polishing and stoning some of the parts, custom fitting some of the parts. And, and that's what I do with this. The, uh, the slide and, and, the, and the frame are lapped, which means you put a uh, polishing compound on there that has a really fine grid and you work this back and forth and just 
makes it like glass, you know, so uh, this gun is, is a great gun to shoot, accurate, smooth, reliable, fun, beautiful, and, uh, and that's what's left of my 1911 face, because I got into that really hard. I had a, a GI model, a World War II model, I had a World War, World War I model, and I had this thing, and, and I, I kind of got through that, you know, I, I, I love the 1911s, but they, do, they just didn't quite hold the, the uh, romanticism that the single action army does for me. But I totally get why people are into those. So that, that's another one of those paths that I went down. And uh, the thing I'm trying to explain to people right now that are in their, in their 20s and 30s, all these people that I, I interact with, is that they're on a journey. They may not realize it yet, but they're on a journey. And they're going to, they're going down some of these paths I've talked about, and they're going to go down other ones. And eventually they're going to get way farther down the road like I am. And when they look back, they're going to realize all the things that they didn't know. And there's a lot of things that, that they don't know. In fact, they don't even know what they don't know about a whole bunch of stuff, you know. Um, for instance, squibs. I have talked to a lot of people that are young men that think that the safe and proper way to shoot is no more than about two shots a second so that you can evaluate whether or not that's a squib. And that's the way people have to shoot today with factory ammunition, I've come to find out. That's beginner level shooting. And it's okay if you want to stay there and evaluate every single round because you have to with this junk factory am am ammunition that they make nowadays. But that is not proper advanced shooting. You can never get out of the beginner phase if you're shooting that slow. Expert shooters can shoot a minimum of five shots a second with a semi-automatic. Some can shoot eight or, or even ten shots a second. And they cannot possibly evaluate every round, and they don't. And they don't have to if they're not shooting garbage ammunition like what's made today in factory ammo. So, I mean, that's one of those things where I'm farther down the road. I remember back in the 90s when factory ammo was unquestionable. I mean, I'm sure there were some failures. I never heard about them. Reloads is what people watched out for. And even their own reloads, they watched out for them. But factory ammo was 100%. If it wasn't 100%, it was 99.99999. You know, you didn't worry about squibs, and now you do, because factory ammo is junk. So I went on another part of the journey, another path was reloading. And I got, I got all my reloading equipment back in 2008 during the, the first uh, sh shortage in modern times, the major shortage there, and uh, haven't regretted it at all. And at the time, I bought all these components, and I learned to reload, and it was, it was a laborious process to learn all that stuff. And I remember when I was buying the components and making the ammo, I did the math. I was like, you know, I'm only saving like one or two cents a round over buying factory. But I stuck with it. I stocked up. And I'm really glad I did because I'm still shooting my 2008 stash for 2008 eight prices in 2023. So if, if you haven't done it already, I recommend if you're serious about shooting, buy, you need to start reloading just so you have safe ammunition. In, in the, the new America we're in now since 2020, uh, there's ammunition shortages in the, and they're making more ammunition now and it is junk. It's not safe to shoot in a lot of cases. So uh, rather than shooting, you know, one shot a second or whatever and evaluating every round, what are you going to do when you get when you get a, a, a double charge? It don't matter if you shoot that slow, it's going to blow up your gun. So if you're serious about shooting, reload. Learn to, learn to reload, invest in it now, stock up on components and pay attention when you reload. Reload, follow the book and reload safely. You know, so that, that's another another journey. And another part of the, the journey that many people go down is the uh, competition phase. And competition isn't something that all shooters get into, but it is fun and it will increase your skill a lot. And I went down that road. I shot uh, cowboy action a little bit and a lot. I... You dirty skirts. Get your stinking paws off me, you damn dirty ape. <laughs> Uh, Outlaw, IDPA, and, and USPSA matches. And uh, in doing that, it, it helped me to become a much better shooter than I was. You know, you don't realize when, before you compete, if you've never competed, you're not nearly as good as you think you are. And you're not going to understand that until you compete against 
other people that have competed before. If you just go out with, I know a lot of guys that just go out with their friends and they shoot with two or three friends or their brother-in-law, whatever, and they always beat that guy and they think they're really good. When they go to a match, they find out what good is, you know, so competition's cool. And I recommend if you like to shoot, you at least try it. You really ought to try it. It's a ton of fun. And I, I dwelt there for 10 years, at least 10 or 10 or 11 years. And I enjoyed it a lot. And But I did also get to the point with that where I'd kind of been there and done that, you know? And I'm not saying I'd done it all, but I mean, I, I, I shot over 100, 100 matches, I'm sure, which to a lot of competitors, that's nothing. That was you know, the first two years that they shot, you know? But um, most of the matches I went to, I had to drive at least 185 miles each way. And when there was a closer match, a local match, you know, I needed to help set up. So that meant two trips. It was really the same amount of mileage. You know, it's just at, at some point you drove to all these matches, you shot them and it starts to feel like a, a rerun, you know? And I also got to the point if, if I didn't win the match, I didn't have fun, you know? And when you get real competitive and you, and when you improve to a certain point, it's no fun to go there and finish, you know, fourth or fifth or sixth in, in the division that you're in, you know, you want to win, you know? And, uh, the last the last year that I competed, um, sorry, I won four or five. I've won five out of. Uh, I won my division five out of fifteen times, and I finished in the top three, uh, eight out of out of the. Uh, I finished in the top three eight out of, out of fifteen times. So, I, I didn't feel like I could improve on that at my age. I was I was uh, fifty two last match that I shot when I was shooting all the time. And I did come back after I hurt my arm and I, I shot a couple more matches just, just as part of the therapy to just get back into the swing of things. But when I, when I had been shooting and training and competing, the, the last year that I shot, I was uh, 52 years old and I just didn't really feel like I could... I, could I, I mean, it's not that I couldn't get any better. I just wasn't interested in trying to get that last percentage that I possibly could do. You know, it, it became more of a uh, a job I didn't get paid for at that point. If I didn't win them, if I didn't win, I, I just wasn't having fun. It wasn't, it just wasn't any fun for me anymore to just go there and do well, do my best. You know, for a lot of people, it's different, and they stay there, and they're still there, and they have fun doing it, and there's nothing wrong with that. You know, but you, that's where my journey took me. So, my journey took me through competition. I improved a lot, and I kind of ended up going back to where I started with the cowboy guns. Because as I've as I've mentioned in my story before, I, I bought a Bob Munder race gun way back in the beginning when I was like 23, 24 years old. And I was a new shooter. I didn't reload. I didn't really know what I was doing. It was too much gun for me, and I sold it right away. But I always wanted to go back there. And so that's why I ended up back in the single action army guns and the race guns. And... Uh, that's where my passion is right now. That's where, that's where the journey has taken me. And, uh, speaking of that, here's a gun I haven't, I've told about, I've shown this gun before. I've not told about it in a video. Somebody's asking me, do you have any stock single action armies? I do. This is a, P a Pieta Great Western II bone stock. It's been a lot of videos, uh, where I hip shoot just kind of slowly. A lot of times it's this gun. And I, it's 100% stock. I haven't touched it. It's a great shooter, very accurate, very fun to shoot. And uh, I, I've left this one stock. And uh, I still love shooting this, even though it's not a race gun. You know, but that's where I've been on, on the shooter's journey. You're taking your own journey. Enjoy it. Um, another thing that I that I end up talking to a lot of people about, they're, they're early in their, in their journey. And I, and I wish I had a, a double action revolver to demonstrate this, but I have never owned one. I've, I've shot them. I've shot other people's. Have let me shoot, other people let me shoot theirs, but I've never owned one. And they operate totally different than, than a single action. And most people have seen a double action revolver, not a single action. And in the comments, a lot of people are they're just perplexed why why I can hold down on the hand, on the trigger and fan this, and it it fires. I, I don't have to release the trigger of them because. A double action is not like that, and if you fan uh, a double action, the the, the uh, cylinder doesn't rotate forward each time. You know, so that's something that's unique to a single action. And anyway, I'm farther down 
the uh, shooter's journey than these people that have never held and actually operated a single action. And, and here's another point is, is a lot of people get confused, perplexed, or aggravated because I shoot blank sometimes. And they're like, that's stupid. There's no bullet that comes out the barrel. And that's exactly what I used to think when I was 20-some years old. And I found out Bob Munden shoots blanks most of the time in his shows. That's stupid. Why do you not shoot real bullets? Well, it's because you can shoot blanks in places where you can't shoot live ammunition because there's no bullets going to do damage somewhere. Blanks also sound way cool. A black powder blank sounds very cool, as you've seen in the videos that I've done. And you can also do some, some shooting tricks that wouldn't be safe with live ammunition, like triple shots and triple shots off the holster with the guns real close to your body. You can do some things that you wouldn't do with live ammunition. I hope those geese aren't drowning me out too bad, but anyway. Um, so blanks are cool. If you haven't shot them, you ought to shoot some for fun. You have to learn how to make them. It's not just an empty cartridge with powder in it. There's a certain way to make them. And a blank cartridge is a dedicated cartridge for blanks only. You don't, you don't do live ammunition and then blanks back and forth. Once you make that brass for blanks, it stays blanks. And I can't tell you anymore, but go on the internet. You can figure out how to make, make blanks. Make them out of real black powder, not the, the artificial junk. And you'll, you can look, you can make the sounds that I do on my videos. And shooting blanks is a hell of a lot of fun. So if you haven't done it, you ought to try it. And then you'll be farther down your shooter's journey like me and you'll understand why blanks are cool. So that's just another example. I hope you guys have enjoyed uh, this video talking about the, the, sh the shooter's journey and, and where we start, where we end up, why some of us are here and here and here. And the thing is, is that the shooting world is way bigger than most people understand. You know, you can't do it all. There's so many different sports and hobbies, corners of this hobby to experiment and you'll never get through all of them. That's what's so cool about it. There's no reason to ever get bored with, with the shooter's hobby. So I hope that's opened people's minds a little bit to all the different places you can go with this hobby and what you can do. And maybe understanding a little bit about something that, that might seem like it's, it's totally dumb is, is just something you haven't experienced, you know? So, I mean, I don't know, maybe even fast draw competition is cool. I've never tried it. So I wanna thank you for tuning in to my video on the journey of the firearms collector and shooter, and I will see you on the next video.